with the idea of what makes you, you, and when you're in a group, how much are you reflecting what the group wants versus what you want? Welcome to your authentic Indian experience coming up today by Rebecca Rowanhorse. I am my own person. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina where I am Una. And I am Crypto. If you are new to the Codex Cantina, we take a conversational approach to the stories that we read. If you're down for stuff like that, make sure you hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, we start off publication information. Welcome to Your Authentic Indian Experience was published August 8th, 2017 in Apex Magazine. And it won the Nebula and Hugo Awards for Best Short Story. You'll understand why. We'll leave a link in the description below where you can read it for free. And we'll also provide a link to our friend Dini, who has performed this story as well. I've been wanting to get this one on our channel for well over two years now, believe it or not. I believe it. <laughs> so Rebecca Rowanhorse, born in 1971 in Arkansas, she has her own indigenous roots that will put a link to her Wikipedia article. She is an American science fiction fantasy writer and writes about her indigenous background. Now, this story seems really easy to relate to, and I think a lot of that has to do with the narration. Now, Crypto, we don't do this narration very often. It's definitely more of a modern technique, but it is what's called second-person narration with the idea that the narration says you as if we are in the story. It's, it's a very immersive experience. Isn't that kind of meta, too, for what the story is? And I know we haven't got to plot yet, but it like puts me in the head of a person just like the story kind of does. It's crazy. I love yeah, it. I love it's, it. It's giving us that virtual experience in a sense. Fake it until you make it in a sense. Exactly. I feel like I was getting the same thing that was truly happening in the story. And that's just so cool. So unique. I love it. And again, I haven't read many stories like this. So it was a very, very new experience for me. And then arguably, isn't this also even a little bit meta for you too? Because you do have some Cherokee background you've shared with us on the channel before. Yeah, part of my family is uh, Native American Cherokee that lives in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And so it was really cool to kind of see this type of story. And I keep thinking to my cousins and my aunt and uncle and everybody that lived there thinking, hmm, I wonder if they've read this and would they feel the same way or not? Right. Because this is arguably racially, you understand it, but maybe culturally, you're not of Cherokee culture. So you kind of you kind of have like that outsider's view. I'm definitely a window in the story, but you definitely have a little bit more intimacy into the subject than what I do. Yeah, I feel like I'm sitting on the window seal where I can, you know, lean over a little further than most because I have those relationships with people that have better experiences as an authentic Native American or Indian, uh, American Indians. So we'll go through plot and then jump into the analysis. Now for plot, I'm going to say we as like the representative identity of us in the story because it says you and we are Jesse Turnblot in this story. A little bit of a weird to try and explain this, but we are working as VR experience guides for tourists. And behind the scenes, we see our company make some questionable decisions of what experiences we are selling. Are they truly authentic or are they things that really just sell well? And we fail to speak out against the things that aren't truly authentic. Now we head into the experience world and are kind of hit by these fake senses and visuals and we're picked to be a guide. However, we immediately disappoint our tourist we just weren't authentic enough for him. We try to give him this nickname of White Wolf, but he still leaves us, and we're worried about losing our job. After work, we head to the bar, and suddenly that's where we see the tourist, White Wolf. He comes into the bar, and we try to reconnect a little bit. So upon meeting him, we talked for over two hours about ourselves, and we agreed to meet up again in the future. And soon this becomes a routine with meeting him at the bar after work, and we become happier and even happier at home with, you know, more loving towards our wife, that sort of thing. And then one day we're sick and unable to meet him at the bar. We don't know his name or how to contact him. So we send the wife and then the wife hangs out with him and has a good time, right? <laughs> so next Monday we go into work and we're fired and the boss is hiring a new, more authentic guy. And it just turns out to be White Wolf, our tourist friend who knows some obscure Indian stuff. He's authentic. So we go to the bar again. <laughs> we drink our woes away and uh, we run into some co co-workers, you know, basically things don't go well. They don't recognize us and they kind of push past us and leave, leave us knocked out in the corner ditch as we're 
We're kind of losing ourselves in our identity. So the next morning, we wake up with blood in our mouth, head home to find that our wife, Teresa, has left us. White Wolf comes and meets us and kind of, he sits us down for the talk and says, look, man, have you ever thought that this is my experience? And then we get, and then we get nauseous the same way that we do when we enter, uh, you know, an experience, and it just kind of, kind of ends, kind of abrupt there in a very unique. What, what I'm going to say. So next week, crypto, you haven't read him yet, but we have um, Charles Waddell Chestnut, and what he does is he plays upon stereotypes in a very interesting way as a black man, and here we have Rebecca Rowan Horse arguably doing a similar tactic with this story. So let's get into this day. Let's start with talking about authenticity and ethnicity, right? Because we're selling this authentic VR experience in the world. And it kind of reminded me of the Westworld story a little bit, right? Like bringing tourists into this experience and they get to live out their fantasies. It's more personal in real life there versus this is the VR world, but it doesn't explore technology directly. It's more about the experience. It definitely has that Matrix vibe to it of kind of pulling the rug underneath you and saying, ha ha ha, this is really what's going on. And I, I love that immersion that you get almost like the, the Westworld comparison. Now, this story, it really seems to sell all bases in terms of what's authentic, right? In terms of the Squaw fantasy, in terms of Custer's Last Stands. You know, we're taking shots at Hollywood in this story in terms of, you know, their views of what it means to be an Indian. We're taking shots at people who are connected via, you know, their heritage, but aren't culturally a part of it. The Pretendians, we have a couple of shots fired there. It just seems to me like everything is on the table with the story, even marriage with the idea that the man's got to be the breadwinner and we have some of the uh, racial stereotypes of just going and getting drunk all day for the, the Native Americans. I think what Rowan Horse is asking us is what does it mean to be authentic? You know, and I like the way it's explored in this story because our hero has this quote, you need to get this right. You try to think of something clever to say, something that would impress her, but let you save face too but you've never been all that clever. So you stick to the truth. And the idea is here is truth is kind of implying authenticity. Yeah, we've known that maybe that not is always the case. Can we believe this narrator or ourselves in this case or the situation that's going on? Even the people here have a protocol that they're supposed to be following, right? We have the quote, a tourist has never broken protocol like this before. Part of why the experience works is that everyone knows their role. And I think this is setting up a lot of those stereotypes that she's going to kind of trying to turn up to 11 in terms of the Native Americans, like, you know, getting drunk and drinking all the time. She's saying that people have their roles that they're expected to fill. And that's where we see the main conflict with Jesse in the beginning, which is they're selling these experiences, these authentic Indian experiences. But then they're like, well, the Squaw fantasy is not really authentic. Why don't we do Custer's Last Stand? And that's where corporate America comes in and says, well, that's not what sells. We're not actually trying to be authentic. We're trying to make money is kind of like the initial conflict that's put before us as the as the main character so all these things are a farce but it always comes back to what can we get out of it what can we gain well i think that leads us towards this whole individuality versus group identity conversation now when you're in a group here's my question is how much of that group is you and how much of you do you change to match the group yeah and i think a lot of times when we look at those different groups too we look at them a couple of different ways, right? You'll look at them breaking down by racial of what they physically look like. And then you look at them kind of culturally as well. How do you identify as a culture by the way you dress, your religion, your music, food, etc.? And that is very, very telling of a person or people's. Nobody wants to buy a vision quest from Jesse Turnblatt, you explain. I need to sound more Indian. <laughs> It's <laughs> so offensive. Well, uh, but it, it's true, right? That's but, or is it true? It's also showing how Jesse is struggling with his own identity and whether he fits in as a true Indian. I mean, he's Catholic. <laughs> Do you remember watching the movie Mel Gibson Maverick, where he goes to the Native Americans and they're they're trading with the Russians and the in the Native American Indian pretends to be all like how white man and he's just putting on this whole show because he's like oh yeah he goes these guys don't want to know what the real thing is they just want to show and it's mm -hmm. the same thing mm -hmm. well i think she explores that even a little bit more deeply in this story the first time we enter that bar we have the quote 
You realize the bartender is waiting, impatient. You drink the same thing every time you come here, a single course light in a cold bottle. But the bartender never remembers you or your order. So here the bartender is putting us in with this group of just patrons, right? And they don't even remember me as a person, what I specifically want to drink. Now, you might think like, well, are you reading too much into that? Look, look where she goes with this story. Later on, when we meet White Wolf, who is arguably the better listener compared to the bartender, right? We're supposed to meet him at 11, but we rolled in at 11.30 p.m., right? Now compare that with the line where it says, the bartender is waiting impatient, okay? Now White okay. Wolf, now White Wolf, the listener, is patient, and what does he get for us? He has a Coors Light drink waiting for us because he does listen and knows that that's something that we wanted to drink. I bartended a little bit in college, and I have to say, this guy must be a crappy tipper because I would remember a good tipper's drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, get, well do, is that not the exact point of you're putting him yeah. in a group? You're putting him in a group yep. of this is someone that will benefit me, right? Yeah, and then, this is the and, good tippers. These are not the good tippers. Exactly. Yep. And you'll notice the next time we repay White Wolf by getting there at 11.05 as opposed to 11.30 the next time. Yeah, so we're trying to meet the standard expectations of you know, that social norm. So here's the question. Is he getting along with White Wolf at this point in time? And I think a lot of people might misinterpret it as yes. That's not what's happening. He doesn't even know White Wolf's name. So again, White Wolf is just a group. He is a patron or a tourist that he's being nice to. He never even bothered to ask him his name. And you'll notice that the way that it's worded, he never even actually really asked about White Wolf. The first two hours that they hung out, it was just you, me, Jesse Turnblatt, talking about myself, kind of a one-way street where true communication, where we're learning about White Wolf, isn't happening. Well, I think this kind of leads us to maybe one of the more key points of the whole story is that what is this kind of whole story representing is that Jesse is a selfish individual representing something else other than himself, right? Well, I think I think part of the argument could also be that you don't identify with groups. You identify with individuals in groups. You can't identify with tourists. You can't identify with some person that you've nicknamed white wolf because there's many people you could have nicknamed that right you try not to recycle them but sometimes you do it's only once you really open up and connect with someone that you can actually truly know them or get to experience what is an authentic relationship is what i would argue no i agree i think so of that too i just think that the whole story itself is kind of an allegory for what happens to the native american culture by the the americans the white europeans that kind of encroach and take over their their homelands and and push their culture out and devastate their culture as a whole as then the native americans are trying to you know incorporate into white society and learn new languages and foods and dress and all of that as well yeah i think this is something where we might lose some people on this part in terms of the allegory but i agree that it's there because we are jesse turnblatt right we're supposed to be the representative of the the indigenous peoples and along comes the European settlers, and what do we lose? We lose our land, right? So at the end, Jesse starts to lose his house. He starts to lose his wife. He loses his job. And what does he do? He starts drinking, which is kind of like what we talked about earlier, which is there's a stereotype that the, the Native Americans are, are drunks, and here we are playing into that. And we have that quote, only the truth that you got yourself fired, that you were on a bender, drunk in some alleyway downtown like a bad stereotype. Yeah, so I think what uh, Rebecca's doing here is that she's taking the stereotype and trying to claim it back as a positive, and she's trying to use it to explain the misrepresentation of this stereotype on the Native American peoples. Then we have the quote, Your thoughts blur to histories. Your words become nothing more than forgotten facts and half-truths. And this kind of speaks to me where the winner writes history. So you get to make that decision as to how that was interpreted in the past as opposed to an individual decision as opposed to a group decision. Yeah, I mean, isn't that kind of the advantage of joining groups is when you're in a group, you're less responsible, you lose a little bit of your individuality, and you can kind of just go with the flow a little bit more? I think perhaps, and we see that a little bit early on from Jesse Turnblatt when the when he, when he went along with the, the CEO on the Squaw Fantasies, he knew that wasn't right, and he knew his coworkers would have backed him up. 
but it's just easier sometimes to go with what the group or what the higher ups say rather than stick out like a when you when you step out from a group you you run this the the possibility of being ostracized from it right it's a lot harder to stick up sometimes for what you believe is right because you feel this pressure from the group to identify with the group and what the group's needs are and as a result of that, you're going to suffer. And then what happens to Jesse? He suffers. He loses his wife. He loses his identity. He loses his home. He loses because of what he does or doesn't do, I guess you could argue. And I think that comes back to the beginning with the epigraph in the great American Indian novel. When it is finally written, all the white people will be Indians and all the Indians will be ghosts. And I think that speaks a little bit back to the the winner writes history, but also even arguably a little bit of the Absalom Absalom story. Well, if you've enjoyed this today, we will leave a link in the description below for our playlist of Rebecca Roanhorse, where you can enjoy more of our chats. Well, Crypto, let's move into our very subjective ratings. What are you going to give this one? I love this story. I'm going to give it a solid eight. I thought it was so cool and unique. Uh, I I guess I love the modern setting as well. That was kind of a retelling of what happened to uh, the Native American peoples and uh, the interaction and a lot with, you know, self-identity and culture and everything. It was there was so much here to unpack. Uh, I feel like we could do another whole video on it as well. So uh, solid eight from me. I enjoyed this one a lot. Obviously, I read it uh, two years ago and it's something that I've wanted to put on this channel for some time now. I'm going to go with a 9 out of 10 for this one. Very emotionally powerful for me. And I really enjoy some of the elements of, you know, in terms of individual versus group identity and the impacts that that has on an individual. I think it's um, very interesting that and then also the way that she kind of takes the stereotypes and turns them up to 11, but then flips it on its head. You know, it's the opposite of what you expected. Very well done. So with that said, guys, if you enjoyed today's talk, we will put episodes out every Monday and Thursday. If that sounds like something you'd want to follow along and join us on the discussions, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. Peace.